اوكي فيرست اوف اول السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين and um, I'm very happy to, to meet you all inshallah in the coming دروس we will get to know each other inshallah very well um, subhanallah you know um, these online classes have their, their pros and cons and um, subhanallah one of the pros is that we're able to meet people from all around Australia and all around the world but one of the cons is that um, you know, we're not able to, to sit together face to face, but inshallah ta'ala, we're going to try to know each other as well as we can inshallah ta'ala. So inshallah ta'ala, there's many things we want to talk about today in the first letters, but um, uh, subhanallah, um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, uh, subhanallah, the, um, uh, what we're going to do and how the book is going to be explained inshallah ta'ala and then we'll start uh, with the topics of today so as we know um, you know subhanallah um, every single madhab out there every single Islamic school of thought has uh, you know a whole huge pile of, of books uh, that that are studied and that uh, are traditionally taught the scholars start from you know uh, certain books and they end with certain books and in order for someone to, to reach a high level of fiqh they have to go through all these levels so subhanallah and, I, and i've noticed this myself if you if you skip the beginner levels of fiqh subhanallah you um you won't benefit from the later books the big books of fiqh even if you are fluent in arabic and subhanallah, I, I, I've noticed or witnessed it myself. I made some mistakes when I first started to study knowledge. Some of my mashayikh made the same mistakes. They mentioned this, that, you know, I try to jump to big books. You know, when we have in, fiqh, in Shafi, for example, Al-Minhaj, you know, by Imam Nawi, it's a huge book. And Al-Minhaj has, I think, has more than 60,000 masail, 60,000 rulings. Over 60,000 rulings just mentioned in the book. So imagine, you know, you've got 60,000 rulings in your head. And more than that, actually, because you explain, you, you study the explanation of the book, you get more than that. Uh, so 60,000 rulings in your head, everyone would think it's, you know, why shouldn't I just jump into that and memorize these rulings? And the become a faqih, become someone who holds the fiqh of this, of, of this huge madhab in my head. Uh, without needing to study 10 different books before that or something like that. But subhanAllah, if you do that, you will end up, uh, subhanAllah, as Imam Malik said in Mopa, uh, فأضلوا, ضلوا وأضلوا. Uh, you would misguide yourself and you would also misguide others because your understanding would be messed up, subhanAllah. So subhanAllah, that is why the scholars have written small little books to begin with and they mention certain details in these small books that might not 26 be, October so. uh, that might not be mentioned in the large book subhanallah no no heaven I can do inshallah brother uh, can I ask to uh, inshallah so subhanallah the scholars have mentioned in these small books what is not mentioned in the larger books of fiqh some details that you find in these books you might not study anymore subhanallah some details that you study in Safina Fin Najah, the art of salvation, the shit of salvation, you might not find in bigger books of fiqh. Uh, why? Because uh, subhanAllah, when the scholars write larger books of fiqh, they assume that you know the masail, you know what is mentioned in the smaller books of fiqh, subhanAllah. So the scholars have written fiqh in a way that only works if you study it in the way they have written it. Uh, every one of the scholars have written multiple books and you find them all starting with small books and going higher and higher and higher. Now, um, subhanAllah, there's so much that I want to talk about today, subhanAllah, so much. Um, you know, you don't know where to start with subhanAllah, you know, when you in, in, in dhurus like this. But um, inshallah ta'ala, uh, I don't want to take too much time because we don't have much time, inshallah ta'ala. So, um, Insha'Allah, the book that we are going to study is a book called is a book called Safina al Najah. Safina al Najah, and you can see it on the screen. I've got the English translation on the screen, and I will be, Insha'Allah Taala, um, sharing the English translation, and I'll soon ask one of the brothers to read the English text. Insha'Allah Taala. So this book is one of the uh, first books that is studied in the Shafi'i Madhab. 
one of the first books that is studied in the Shafi'i Madhab. It is famous in a few countries, especially in uh, Yemen, because the author of this book uh, is from Al Yemen. The author of this book is from Al Yemen. And we know that, um, subhanAllah, in the late uh, uh, years of, uh, of this Ummah, the Shafi'i Madhab is very strong in certain countries. So um, it's very strong in, uh, in, in Egypt. It's been like that for uh, since the time of Imam Shafi'i, uh, not long after Imam Shafi'i. It's very strong in Asham, so in, 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 in Syria, in Jordan. You find some parts of Lebanon also have that. Uh, rather than Shafi'i, some parts of Palestine also have Shafi'i. So in Asham, you also find it very strong in Al-Hijaz, Mecca and Medina. Uh, in the Haramain, and uh, we'll talk about this later on, inshallah. You find that the Shafi'i Madhab is also very strong in uh, a lot of the Asian countries, so um, parts of uh, China, Dagestan, uh, all these countries have certain regions that are Shafi'i. Also, you know, like Chechnya and those countries, Dagestan, those countries, they all affected from the Asian uh, regions that accepted the Shafi'i fiqh a long time ago. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, all those countries, Taiwan, uh, totally Shafi'i. And um, subhanAllah, um, also parts of India uh, are Shafi'i. So these countries that I mentioned have been Shafi'i for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And these countries have produced scholars who were leaders of fiqh in their time, who were muftis and who were qadi in their time. And they used to uh, you know, be the main uh, teachers of fiqh in their time. So uh, Yemen had many scholars of Shafi'i fiqh that came out of in, when we study In uh, when we study the history of Shafi'i fiqh, it's a different subject. Uh, you know, we, we, go, we come across many big scholars of the past that were from Yemen, like uh, Imam, uh, Ibn Ziyad al-Yamani and, um, and other scholars that uh, used to uh, be mentioned in the books of fiqh. So one of the later scholars of Yemen was the scholar who wrote this book. Uh, so this book, Safinat al-Najah, is a book that was written for beginners. People used to start with this book when they wanted to study the Shafi'i Madhab. He mentions things that you need to know that are a must for every Muslim who wants to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to this school of thought. Now, the author of this book is uh, Al-Allama Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Sumair al-Habrami. Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Sumair al-Habrami. So um, he was a scholar of his time and he studied under his father and other scholars of his time. Now, <clears throat> uh, SubhanAllah, the scholar who wrote this book was well known in his time, but we don't have that much uh, mentioned about his uh, biography and his, uh, his life. Although the scholars of, of Shafi'i al fiqh around the world accepted his book and they've been explaining it for many years. So the book was written uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, uh, was written 1,271 years after Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, around that time. So not that long ago, but since his time, the scholars have been explaining this book. So we find great scholars, great, great scholars uh, who have explained this book. Like for example, we have Al-Allama uh, Salim al-Shatari, who is an author of another big book in Shafi'i Fiqh, uh, important book, which is Al-Yaqut al-Nafis. He explained this book. We find other great scholars of Mecca, uh, like uh, and also Indonesia, like Al Imam Muhammad Nawawi ibn Umar al Jawi. This scholar was one of the great, greatest scholars to ever live in the later uh, times. Uh, he was from Indonesia originally, and he grew up and studied under the scholars of uh, Mecca, of uh, Al Haram al Makki. So, subhanAllah, uh, Muhammad Nawawi ibn Umar. Al-Jawi. He has a similar name to Imam Nawawi, but he's not Imam Nawawi, he's a different Nawawi. This is one of the greatest scholars of Indonesia. And if you go to Indonesia and Malaysia, he's very well known. His books are sold everywhere in these countries. And I love his books because the way he writes is very, subhanAllah, is very beautiful. 
he simplifies uh, knowledge in a beautiful way. So he wrote a very uh, large explanation in this book. So he explained Safinat Najah uh, in a book that he called Kashifatu uh, Saja. Kashifatu Saja, Sharh Safinat Najah. There's many other explanations of this book. Anyway, so this book is, is a, a very important book and it's not that long, which is good. And also, if you're not used to studying fiqh, if you're not used to studying fiqh, it's good to start with a short book like this because, subhanAllah, it will give you the taste. It will give you a taste of fiqh. So you will be, uh, subhanAllah, you'll be able to basically, uh, subhanAllah, you know, start to understand the way the scholars talk and the words they use, the terms they use, and, and how, they, they, how they write in fiqh, basically. So say, taking, taking a short book like this is really important if you want to take other steps uh, further into uh, al-fiqh. <clears throat> so, um, inshallah ta'ala, uh, soon we'll start reading the book. Uh, we'll start reading Bismillah ar rahim But before we start reading the book, uh, before we start reading the book, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, fiqh and about the Shafi'i Madhab, inshallah ta'ala. So, um, subhanallah, uh, as we know, the four madahib, the four schools of thought, started very early on uh, in uh, al hijra The four madahib started very early in al hijra And um, the madhab that we are studying now is the madhab of Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, we have to know who we are studying, the madhab of the person we are studying, of course. And in the larger books of fiqh, they always mention the uh, a short biography of the Imam and the start of the book. So Imam Shafi'i was born um, in the year 150, 150 years after the Hijrah of Prophet So 150 Hijri, Imam Shafi'i was born and he died, he passed away رحمه الله تعالى 204. So he uh, had a very short life رحمه الله. He, will, he lived, the, yeah, he was the, you know, the youngest of the four Imams to die. Allah, the youngest of the four Imams to die. And uh, subhanAllah, they always mention that people who are very smart, very, very smart, they usually pass away early, subhanAllah. So Imam Shafi'i was an example of someone who passed away very early but left a lot of knowledge behind. Imam Nawawi is similar to him. You know, he died in, he was, was only 46 when he died. SubhanAllah, um, Imam Shafi'i was uh, a bit older than that, but also very, very young. So he was 54, when he died. So um, Al Imam al Shafi'i was born as an orphan and he was born in Gaza. He was born in Gaza, Allah ta'ala an. And when he was young, his mother decided to take him to Mecca because she was originally from Mecca. So she took him to Mecca and he started to study. He started to study Rahimahullah ta'ala under the scholars of Mecca. It was mentioned that you know, in Mecca that time, uh, you had people, you know, you had the tabi'een, you had people who studied under the Sahaba. So Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala studied under the great scholars of Mecca, like the Mufti of Mecca, Muslim ibn Khalid al-Zinji, Muslim ibn Khalid al-Zinji, uh, and other scholars of Mecca. And uh, subhanAllah, when he was nine years old, he finished memorizing the Quran. When he was 10 years old, he memorized the most famous book of hadith in their time, the Muwatta. Imam Malik had a famous book of hadith called al Muwatta, uh, which had uh, you know, very important hadith for anyone who wants to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Shafi memorized the motto when he was 10 years old. And he studied for many years under the scholars of Mecca. It was mentioned that when he was around 15 years old, his Shaykh, Muslim ibn Khalid al Zinji, gave him permission to give fatwa. Gave him permission to give fatwa when he was 15 years old. So he, reached, he, he was uh, able to give fatwa and to, uh, you know, look into the Quran and Sunnah alone without a madhab. That's how strong he was in knowledge uh, by the age of 15, rahimahullah ta'ala. He later on uh, went to Imam Malik and he studied under Imam Malik in Medina for uh, a while and Imam Malik also gave him permission to give fatwa. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala later on in his life went to uh, Iraq, went to Baghdad and he spent uh, some time in Baghdad and he started to teach. He studied under the scholars of Baghdad and he also started to teach in Baghdad. He had students in Baghdad and he had basically a small school of thought inside Baghdad. So he had students who would uh, come to him and take fatwa from him and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to his opinion. And he wrote some books when he was in Baghdad and then he went back to Mecca and then he 
went back to Baghdad again later on in his life for one month, and then he ended off in Egypt. When he entered Egypt, he basically, you know, he stayed there for the rest of his life. And subhanAllah, Imam Shafi'i, because he had students in Baghdad, and then later on, he went to Egypt, uh, the madhab had something very unique. Imam Shafi'i had two madhabs. He had two opinions. He had a school of thought that was established in Baghdad, and then his opinion changed later on in his life in multiple issues, many major issues. So he, his ijtihad, his looking into the Quran, Sunnah changed uh, uh, you know, to a very high percent in many issues. And he started to write his books again. And he started to teach from zero again. And Imam Shafi'i has two opinions, two schools of thought, two madhabs. They have, he has al-madhab al-qadim, his old opinion, and his new opinion, al-madhab al-jadid. So if you look into Shafi'i fiqh, you always hear that there is Qadim and there's Jadid. There's old opinions and there's new opinions. The old opinion, Al Qadim, uh, is what Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala uh, gave fatwa on when he was in Al Iraq. And he wrote some books when he was in Iraq. His most famous book he wrote when he was in Iraq was the Kitab Al Hujja and another book called Al Risala Al Iraqiya. Now, Imam Shafi'i has uh, many scholars who were. Uh, under him when he was in Iraq, so many people who narrated his madhab, who carried his madhab on, his old madhab, and there are four main scholars who carried Imam Shafi'i's old madhab when he was in Al Iraq. So we have uh, four main scholars who were the main uh, carriers of his madhab when he was in Iraq, his old madhab. Number one, we have Al Imam Ahmad bin Hamdur, he was a narrator of Imam Shafi'i's madhab. He was basically Shafi'i uh, in his younger age. Um, we also have Al-Za'farani, Al-Imam Al-Za'farani. We have Al-Karabisi and we have Abu Thawr. These are four great scholars. If, you, if you're into hadith and into reading hadith, you'll hear these names mentioned in the isnad of hadith sometimes. So Abu Thawr and others, these are big muhaddithin that uh, you know, have reached very high ranks in Islam. They were all students of Imam Shafi'i. The greatest muhaddith of the time were students in fiqh. Uh, um, uh, of Imam Shafi'i. Now, Imam Shafi'i uh, later on went to Egypt and he had many students in Egypt. Everyone in that country basically, uh, you know, subhanAllah, uh, went to study under him and he's the, the most famous scholars who, who narrated his new madhab, who carried his new madhab, were seven, seven main carriers of his new madhab in Egypt. So the most famous scholars who were his students and who, who narrated to us the madhab of Imam Shafi, the new madhab, al-jadid, are al-imam al-muzani, al-imam al-muzani, and al-imam al-buwayti, wal-imam al-rabi' al-muradi, wal-rabi' al-jizi, wal-imam harmala, wal-imam Muhammad ibn al-hakam, wal-imam Abdullah ibn al-zubayr al makki so these are some of the scholars who narrated the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. After that, after that, the Shafi'i madhab, the scholars of Imam Shafi'i after he passed away, they, subhanAllah, they all went to different, different directions. They didn't just live in Egypt. They went to different directions. Because subhanAllah, some scholars, some of his students went and lived in Iraq. They went back to Iraq. Some of them went to very far countries in the far east. Um, so some of the, um, you know, the, the non-Arab countries that had just entered Islam. And subhanAllah, every one of them started to spread and to teach the madhab to his students. So subhanAllah, from the moment Imam Shafi'i died, it wasn't in Egypt where the madhab started to grow, but it started to grow all around the world, especially in Iraq, in Iraq, and also in what they call Mawra and Nahr, in uh, basically the countries that are, uh, that we today we hear the word uh, you know um, Stan, Tajikistan, uh, um, Uzbekistan, these countries that's usually called Mawra and Nahr. So those countries also had a lot of Shafi'i uh, students around Shafi'i who lived there and started to spread his madhab. And great huge scholars came out of both of these two different uh, regions. And we had in the history of the Shafi'i madhab two schools of thought inside the Shafi'i Matab, the Iraqi school and the Mawra al nahr school. The, uh, you know, the, um, the school that was from the, the non-Arab countries. 
and both both these schools agreed in most of their opinions but subhanallah they, they used to you know um, complete each other subhanallah um and the shafi might have continued to grow and grow and grow and you had you know like scholars from iraq who were very big in hadith and Athar, and then schools from the other countries who were very big in, uh, in, in, in using their mind and stuff like that. So subhanAllah, the madhab in itself had so many different aspects that were very unique. Uh, some of the scholars who came later on in history and uh, also, you know, um, helped the madhab expand even more and were great encyclopedias of knowledge in, 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 in language and in, uh, you know, in logic and other things was Al-Imam Al-Juwaini, Al-Imam Al-Juwaini, um, he was in the fourth uh, century of Hijra. He was probably one of the greatest people to ever work, scholars to work on the, the face of the earth. He, subhanAllah, wrote very deep uh, writings in the Shafi'i Madhab and he had multiple books and he was basically one of the, uh, the milestones in the Shafi'i Madhab. After Imam Joini, there's also Imam Ghazali who had a lot of very big and important works and many other scholars. Let's jump a few hundred years, inshallah, and then until we reach Al-Imam uh, Al-Nawawi and Al-Imam, before Imam Nawawi, of course, uh, Al-Imam Al-Rafi. These two scholars were later on in history and they were basically the, the ones who, uh, yani, uh, Yani they, they went through all the work of the scholars before them and they wrote what was known as the, the latest opinion of the Shafi'i Madhab, the strongest, most approved opinion of the Shafi'i Madhab. So the scholars after them usually only take from the sayings of Imam Nawi and Imam Rafi because they have literally gone through every single piece of work out there and compared it to the words of Imam Shafi'i and to the usul al-fiqh that Imam Shafi'i wrote and the books that he wrote and um, subhanAllah, uh, uh, made sure that it was correct. So um, after them, most of the scholars used to go by their sayings and uh, the scholars after Imam Nawawi uh, mostly, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, did like revision and uh, uh, they used to um, continue and build on what Imam Nawawi said. The most famous scholars that we hear, that we study the books after Imam Nawawi is of course in Imam Ibn Hajar, Al-Haytami and Imam Al-Ramli. These are scholars that you hear inshallah in this book um, many times. <coughs> now, um, every madhab out there has uh, subhanAllah special things about them. So some of the most important and special uh, unique things about the Shafi'i madhab uh, is uh, number one, that Imam Shafi'i is uh, the only Imam from the four Imams that are from Quraysh that are from uh, Quraysh and um, so he is uh, he goes back to uh, his his great grandfather is the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so um, in a hadith uh, it was mentioned in one of the hadith that Rasulullah sallam mentioned to to respect people of Quraysh because the imam that comes from them will fill the whole entire universe full of knowledge the majority of scholars believe that this hadith is talking about Imam Shafi'i but this hadith is talking about Imam Shafi'i. Um, another uh, unique thing about this madhab is that Imam Shafi'i, when he did this, uh, when he traveled the world, he went to, he visited Yemen, he visited Sham, he visited Egypt, he visited Iraq multiple times. He basically studied with every single mufti and scholar of fiqh in his time, and he took from them all, and he, so he had a very wide uh, uh, any um, uh, range of of opinions and understanding and interpretations that he could choose from rahimahullah ta'ala so he was very wide in his knowledge and this hadith that rasulullah said inna imamahum yamla'u al-ard 'ilman the, the imam that comes from quraysh is going to fill the world with knowledge it shows that he had a very wide view of of, of knowledge also one of the uh, unique things is that the shafi'i madhab has always been the dominant madhab in uh, hijaz so in, in, in Mecca uh, for hundreds of years, not at the time of Imam Shafi'i, but after, yani later on, a few hundred years later, uh, in also in, so in Hijaz and Haramain, in, um, in Egypt and in Sham. So these are very important regions for the Muslims throughout the history. Um, and yani there's, there is many important things about every single matter, but these are some of the things that, that are very important to know before we study, study any book of, of fiqh, of course. <clears throat> 
Okay, inshallah ta'ala, we will uh, start with this book inshallah ta'ala now. So can I ask if any uh, of the brothers is, is happy to, um, uh, to uh, be the one who's reading inshallah ta'ala? So I'll ask the, um, the, the brother who reads to inshallah ta'ala um, uh, read the section and then I'll explain that section. Then we'll continue like that inshallah ta'ala every single every single time. So is anyone who is happy to read, inshallah ta'ala? If we could um, uh, put the hands up. Does anyone raise their hand? I can't see any hands up. Sheikh, I don't mind Sheikh to read. Who's this? Jawad. Jawad, I know Sheikh and Jazakum Nakhira. Alhamdulillah. Allah. Bismillah. Inshallah ta'ala. Can you start reading Inshallah ta'ala? Okay. Uh, do I just start from the ship of salvation? Uh, so, yeah, so, um, not the ship of salvation, just Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, all praises to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. We seek help. I'll just, I'll read the Arabic, then you can read English, inshallah. Let's read the book first. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qa'ar ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa bihi nasta'een ala amuri dunya wa deen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad, khatim al nabiyyin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa la hawa la quwta illa billahi alihi al-Aqim. Bismillah. Tafadda. Salutation and peace upon our Master Muhammad the seal of prophethood and upon all his family and companions. There is no power and might except through Allah, the Most High, the Most Great. This uh, chapter is what's known in fiqh as al muqaddima the introduction. So muqaddima in Arabic means what it is from al-Qaddama, so something that, uh, uh, that basically uh, something that is first. Whoever's first is the person who is mutaqaddim. So whoever's first is mutaqaddim, and this part of the book is mutaqaddim, is before the other parts of the book. So the introduction in Arabic is called al muqaddimah And uh, usually in the introduction, the scholars mention, uh, uh, they, they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and they send salah upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they make a dua. Why do they do this? Why do scholars of fiqh uh, start with Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salat Asalam, Rasulullah every single time for multiple reasons. For multiple reasons. So the scholars always start with Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim for multiple reasons. I'll mention, I'll mention inshallah ta'ala, uh, I'll mention inshallah ta'ala, um, one of those reasons that the scholars start with Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Number one, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith, and this hadith, Imam As-Subki says that this hadith is, is very strong and it is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, sahih and a lot of scholars believe that it's sahih, if not hasan. Uh, so the hadith says that Prophet said, Kullu amrin la rahim Every single matter that's important. And you do not start with saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim it will not be complete. Meaning that even if it seems that it's complete, it's not actually complete. The barakah is not there. The meaning of it is not complete, even if it seems complete to the eye. So if we were to eat to eat food and we don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, maybe uh, we feel like we're full, but subhanAllah, we're missing out on so many things that we don't see because we have a shadow on our eyes. If we, uh, subhanAllah, start reading a book and studying a book, and we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we might finish the book, but subhanAllah, maybe every single student will forget the book in a very short uh, period of time, subhanAllah. So starting with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is very important for, for a Muslim, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, has mentioned in this hadith that everything that you don't start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim will not have complete barakah. You will have something wrong with it, subhanAllah. So that's the first reason. The second reason that we start with Bismillah ar-Rahim is that we copy the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started the Quran with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now, Imam Shafi'i, we're studying the Shafi'i Madhab. The Shafi'i Madhab is very strong on Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim being the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha. It's very strong on that. So the book of Allah started with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We also start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now, even the other madahib, they start with Bismillah because they follow the Quran. Why? Because as Al Imam al Shatibi in the seven Qur'at, Al Imam al Shatibi says that the scholars have agreed upon starting a recitation with Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. There's difference in if Bismillah is a part of the Surah, Surah Al Fatiha or not, but there's no difference that if you start reciting the Quran, you start with Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. The uh, third reason that you start with Bismillah is that the Prophet وسلم, started many of his messages and, uh, and things with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Not only the Prophet وسلم, but also the other Prophets. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of Sayyidina Dawood, uh, Sayyidina Sulaiman salam, when he sent a message to the Queen of Sabbath. He said, uh, in that message, it said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu bismillah. Wa, uh, she said, innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah ta'ala alayhi wa tuni muslimin. This message, the queen said, this message that has came to me is from Sulaiman and it starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, subhanAllah, this is the tradition of the Prophet sallam, and the prophets before him and the scholars of Islam. We were ordered to follow the footsteps of the scholars of Islam. Imam Shafi'i himself, he wrote many books. And he was the, the, the first person to write in Usul Fiqh. And the first person to write in another uh, field, which is called Mukhtalif al-Hadith, where how, how to understand the differences between Hadith and how to make them match and not uh, uh, contradict each other. So his books all start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So this is the tradition of the scholars of Islam throughout history. Imam Bukhari, in Sahih Bukhari, is started with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Whoever has heard the narration of Sahih Bukhari, and you read Sahih Bukhari with the Snad, you find it starting with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Imam Malik with Mutlaq, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the tradition of the scholars of Islam. So these are uh, four main reasons that we start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and the scholars of Fiqh also start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim for those reasons. Now, <clears throat> what does Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim mean? And I don't mean to spend too much time explaining Bismillah, but SubhanAllah, the only reason we are spending a lot of time explaining Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is because in this book, we're going to focus on certain things and not focus on others. We're going to focus on the things that the scholars of fiqh used to focus on. If you open the traditional books of fiqh, they, they focus so much on Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And not only in fiqh, in tafsir in other books. It was narrated that Imam Ali radiallahu anhu used to say, he said, used to say that if I was able, if you let me talk and not stop talking, I will basically, subhanAllah, mention so many different important meanings that come from Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to the point that if you wrote everything that I say, the books will not be able to be carried by less than 70 camels. Books upon books upon books, all just talking about Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. SubhanAllah, that's what Imam Ali radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu was one of the most knowledgeable Sahaba. As we call him, Babu Madinat al -Ilm. Babu Madinat al -Ilm. He is the door to the, uh, to the city of knowledge, which is Rasulullah If you want uh, to learn knowledge, go through Ali radiallahu anhu. He has the inter interpretations and the knowledge that others do not have radiallahu anhu. <clears throat> so Bismillah is so important that scholars like, like, like um, you know, the Mufassirin after the Sahab also used to spend a big portion of tafsir just talking about Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Imam al-Razi also in his Fatih al his tafsir, you know, he talks in a very lengthy uh, way about Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? When we say Bismillah, what do we intend? Every time we start this dars, we should say Bismillah. What do we intend? We intend. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim means that you, uh, subhanAllah, um, you start with the company of Bismillah ar-Rahman the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're starting by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The name is going to be with you. The name is going to be with you throughout your dars. Uh, there's so many meanings that you can, you can in Arabic, uh, you can talk about the ba, but I don't want to get into that, inshallah ta'ala. Now, um, the scholars mentioned something very interesting here. 
according to Shafi'i Madhab. Bismillah, Bismillah has five rulings in fiqh. Bismillah has five main rulings in fiqh. Let's mention the rulings of Bismillah rahman in fiqh. In some cases, Bismillah is compulsory. It's compulsory to say Bismillah in certain cases, like, for example, like when you are in Salah and you're reading Surah Al-Fatiha, in the, in, in, when you're in Salah, you have to say Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. It's compulsory. It's haram to say Bismillah in other cases. Like if you want to do something haram, then it's also haram for you to say Bismillah and start it. If you start something haram with Bismillah rahman rahim you get two sins. You get the sin of doing the haram thing and also the sin of saying Bismillah uh, when you start that, that, that haram uh, act that you are going to do. Um, it's also disliked makruh. It's disliked to say bismillah if you're going to start something that is disliked. If you're going to start some, do something that is disliked, it's, 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 it's disliked to start it with bismillah rahman rahim. It is also mustahab or sunnah. It is also recommended to say bismillah rahman rahim if you're going to start anything important. Anything important, uh, important in the eyes of, uh, of the sharia. In the eyes of Islam, of course, um, yani, uh, you know, just playing soccer or something is not something that uh, you know uh, would be seen as uh, you know uh, important in the Islamic eyes, even though it's important to a lot of people out there. So important means important according to uh, the deen. Reading books, um, uh, you know. Um, uh, when you start reading the Quran, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, when someone starts writing the book, they should say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's all Sunnah, Mustahab. You get rewards for doing so. If you don't do it, you don't get any sins. But if you do, you get rewards. Um, and then they said it's Jaiz. It is not recommended, nor it is is it disliked to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim if you are studying something that's not important, it's something normal, it doesn't have really any importance to it. Uh, just a normal thing, then you can say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim if you want, but there's no uh, main uh, reward in saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in this case. <clears throat> After he said Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen means all praise, every single praise out there belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why does it belong to Allah? Why does all the types of praise out there belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because we are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our actions are created by Allah. Allah creates our actions. So when we do something, the real praise should go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the one who made us do that thing. He is the one who helped us do that thing. He is the one who uh, created our actions and created that action itself. So if you're happy about something, you should praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you praise the person who did that act. Now, every praise goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's the creator of everything. He also deserves to be praised even if he did, even if he did not give us anything, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So um, he gave us everything, so he should be praised for that as well. Now, um, also, alhamdulillah has many different rulings in fiqh. So it's compulsory to say alhamdulillah in certain cases, like the, in, in, on the day of Jumu'ah, it's compulsory for the khatib. For the person who's giving khutbah to say alhamdulillah. If this khutbah in Jumu'ah starts without alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, the khutbah is not considered uh, a valid khutbah. It's invalid. It, the, you have to repeat the khutbah again. The imam has to go up and repeat the khutbah again. If someone goes on Jumu'ah and starts talking, um, assalamu alaikum, um, you know, um, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give sadaqah wa akhud da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, the Jumu'ah salah is not, is not, is not correct. Yeah, they all have to repeat their salah again. Why? Because the khatib did not say alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. So alhamd is compulsory in certain cases like Jumu'ah. Uh, hamd also is sunnah in other cases like khutbah uh, nikah When someone's getting married, when they want to get married, they should say alhamdulillah wa salatu wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sallam. And then they, they say the, uh, the basically the, 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 the um, the nikah, which is the watch to kulana and stuff like that. Um, also, it's uh, disliked to say alhamdulillah uh, if you're going to do, if you did something disliked, if something that's makruh happens, then you shouldn't say alhamdulillah uh, for that. Something haram that you do, don't say alhamdulillah. You should say astaghfirullah, then say alhamdulillah. And um, these are the, the main uh, rulings regarding alhamdulillah. Okay. 
Uh, after that, he said, uh, Alhamdulillah, was salatu, was salamu, uh, ala Rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, alayhi wa bihna stain, ala umuri din He said, We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in worldly affairs and in matters of deen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can help us in anything. Whether it's something to do with this dunya, whether it's something to do with the akhirah. And then he said, may peace and blessings be upon our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khatim al the seal of prophets. Now, um, he said, our master. In Arabic, the word Sayyid, Sayyidina Muhammad, we always hear this word Sayyid, uh, has four main meanings. Sayyid in Arabic means four things. It means the person who uh, you know, is above the rest of the people uh, around him. So sad and nas, he's above them. He is their master, basically. It also means the person who has a very big following and army. It also can be used for the person who has a lot of wisdom and doesn't get angry when people try to, uh, try to bother him. And it also, uh, you know, these are the main means of Sayyid, and they all, 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 all fall under uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was definitely a Sayyid in all uh, of these different um, uh, ways. <clears throat> now, what does Allahumma Salli Alaihi Muhammad mean? What does Salah upon Rasulullah? We always say, you know, send Salah upon Rasulullah. Send salvation to uh, upon Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Say Allahumma Salli Alaihi Muhammad. What's the meaning of Salah upon Rasulullah? <sighs> It means, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So salah means for Allah to have mercy upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And salam is a greeting. Is basically like a greeting to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends mercy upon him and also uh, uh, sends him a greeting, uh, raises him in ranks, uh, gives him uh, protection sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are all meanings that fall under Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Now, um, uh, subhanAllah, uh, Imam Rafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala has a very beautiful explanation when he talks about salah and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Imam Rafi'i says, and I'll read it in Arabic and then I'll, inshallah ta'ala, I'll explain in English. He says, ma'na uh, dhalik, so the meaning of Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad, ay abdham Allahu Muhammadan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, show the greatness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fi dunya bi ala idhikri. May Allah show his greatness in this world, in this world, in this life, by uh, making his, uh, his name sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the, making people remember him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, all over the world. Wa adama shara'ahu fil akhirah. And also make his religion, the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be spread across the whole entire world forever. وفي الآخرة, in the hereafter, بتشفيعه في أمتي, by making him the one who intercedes for, uh, for his ummah, for his nation, for his followers, by sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وإزالي مفهومتي, and giving him the best of rewards, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the akhirah as well. وإبداء فضله الأولين والآخرين بالمقال المحمد. And also, by showing his status to those who were, who were before him and those who were after him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the whole of creation, by Al Maqam Al Mahmud, by the great intercession that he does, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their judgment, when he intercedes for the whole of the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, um, these things are already there, so we don't. Yani, we, the Prophet does not need us to send salah upon him for in order for him to get to gain these types of uh, of, of, of ranks. But Imam Rafi says, Imam Rafi says that basically subhanallah these ranks uh, these meanings have multiple ranks so subhanallah you know shafa'a and being higher than others has like oh, you know millions and millions and millions of ranks rasulullah can allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make him uh, you know get higher and higher in ranks every single day so the more we send salat uh, the higher he might get salat which is a beautiful meaning that um that the scholars mention I'm talking about Salah upon Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, and then he said, was Sahbihi and his followers and family and companions. Uh, the companions of Rasulullah Sallam were those who witnessed Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in their life 
uh, they witnessed Rasulullah Sallallahu and they died as Muslims. They witnessed Rasulullah in their life, in his lifetime, and they died as Muslims. That is what a Sahabi is, its opinion. Now, the most famous opinion is that the Sahaba were around 60,000. 60,000 Sahaba that saw Rasulullah Sallallahu and died as Muslims. And other nations say they are more than that. Over 100,000 Sahabi. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Then he said, وَلَا حَوْلَ قُوَةَ بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمِ He said, there is um, no, uh, he said, there is no power uh, uh, through other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. After that, Akhi, can we go to the next chapter, inshallah ta'ala? Uh, I'll read in Arabic and you read in English, inshallah ta'ala. So he said, after that, فَصْلٌ فِي بَيَانِ دَعَائِمِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَأَسَاسِ إِلْسَائِهَا أَرْكَانُ الْإِسْلَامِ خَمْسَةً <coughs> شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وصوم رمضان وحج البيت من بيت وحج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا. Can you read brother? Uh, me brother? Yes. Okay. Uh, to bear witness that there is no God except Allah and the so section. We read from section section. Our section section the integrals of Islam are five to bear witness that there is no God except Allah and Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah to establish to establish salah to discharge zakah to fast in the month of Ramadan to, to perform hajj for those who are able now nah. so um, uh, in this book most books of fiqh do not talk about the pillars of Islam but in this book um, subhanallah he wants to mention the pillars of Islam and the pillars of Arkan quickly for a reason. The reason of this is that, subhanAllah, uh, fiqh and aqidah are built on the hadith that talks about the pillars of Islam and the pillars of Iman. But, uh, subhanAllah, the scholars basically uh, tackle that in a different way uh, that's not mentioned in the hadith. So he wants to mention the hadith first, and then after that, go into the, the scholarly tradition of explaining uh, the uh, pillars of Islam in a very unique, slow way by cutting them up and explaining everyone individually in a way that the scholars of fiqh do. Now, <clears throat> let's go through this hadith quickly. We're not going to go through the rulings, inshallah ta'ala, because the rulings of this hadith are going to be mentioned in uh, fiqh, inshallah ta'ala. But before that, I just wanted to say that um, we know that the scholars of fiqh, and it's very important to understand this, have basically written fiqh in a very unique way. So, the scholars of Islam looked into the hadith of Rasulullah that says that Islam Islam was built on five main pillars. Islam is five main things. This is mentioned in many hadith, yes? We all know this hadith very well. Shahadat uh, and Allah, witnessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is messenger, praying, establishing salah, um, uh, then to give, is giving zakat, fasting month of Ramadan, and performing hajj. Now, Rasulullah mentioned that these are the main Pillars of Islam, the main acts of worship. There's so many other acts of worship out there, but like Al Imam Ibn Hajar al Haytami says uh, in his explanation of the Arba'in Nawi or the four hadiths of Imam Nawi, that these acts of worship are the greatest act of worship, acts of worship. And these acts of worship are the only are the acts of worship that are compulsory upon every single Muslim individually. Other acts of worship might be compulsory in certain times and might not, but these acts of worship are compulsory upon every single Muslim who has reached the age of puberty and is, and is in his full might. Now, most of the Islamic rulings fall under these five pillars. So when you talk about salah, we talk about the conditions of salah, we talk about tahara, we talk about dhikr, we talk about reading Quran, we talk about all the other rulings uh, that are fiqhi rulings and not part of salah, but they fall under uh, salah in one way or another. So most of the Islamic rulings will be mentioned in the books of fiqh under these five pillars uh, in one way or another. So the scholars said, you know, they basically look into this hadith and they built fiqh of the, the fiqh of, of, of Islam according to this hadith. Uh, so they said, they said that basically the first pillar is witnessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and that Rasulullah is the message of Allah. But this first pillar needs a lot of explanation. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who is the Prophet sallallahu What does it mean to believe in Allah? What does it mean to believe in Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Needs a lot of explanation. So they did not put this into fiqh. They put this into a different, totally different category, and they wrote special books about this, which were known as the books of Aqidah, books of Ilm al-Tawheed, Ilm al-Aqidah, Usul al-Din. 
So the books of Aqidah talk about La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That's it. As we know, if we study books like uh, uh, Al Imam al Sanusi when he wrote Umul Barahin, uh, in the end of his book, he mentioned how every single thing he mentioned in Aqidah falls under Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Imam Sanusi mentioned this in, in uh, the end of his famous book, Umul Barahin, uh, which is uh, known as As Sanusiya uh, by some. So they didn't mention La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, in fact. Some did, but most of them didn't mention it. So they started with Salah. And then, you know, when they're talking about Salah, Salah has many conditions. But there's one condition of Salah that has hundreds and thousands of, of matters of issues that fall under it. And if we were to put it with Salah, you know, the book of Salah would be very long, which is At-Tahara, cleanliness. Cleanliness is so long and complicated that the scholars thought it's best to give it its own separate chapter of fiqh, chapter of tahara, which shows how, yani, subhanAllah, the Islamic, uh, any book of fiqh is open, you start with tahara, you start with clean, being clean, subhanAllah, which shows how, how beautiful the tradition of Islam is that we start with tahara. The first thing we ever study in any institute around the world is tahara. We never start with other tahara, uh, which shows the importance of tahara for a Muslim, subhanAllah. So, fiqh starts with tahara. It's the biggest condition for salah, the largest, the, the most, yani the condition of salah that has the most, uh, the largest amount of rulings that fall under it. Also, tahara is a condition that subhanAllah can never be neglected. So some conditions of salah can be left out sometimes, most conditions. Facing the qibla is a condition, but it's not a condition if you are traveling and you're praying sunnah prayer and you're riding on you're riding on your on your donkey or your camel. You don't have to face the qibla anymore. Uh, Subhanallah. Also, um, if you um, you know if there's a, a najasa on you and you can't remove the najasa, in some cases you're able to pray with najasa on you. But tahara, there's no case that you're allowed to pray with that. If you can't make wudu, there's a special different type of tahara that comes into fiqh called tayammum, just because uh, tahara is so important. Because of the importance of tahara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set down a whole separate ruling for those who cannot find water and cannot make wudu, which is called tiyamun. And according to Shafi'i Matab, even if you can't find uh, anything to make tiyamun with, you need to pray without wudu, but then you have to repeat your prayer once you find uh, water or you find dust to make tiyamun with. So, <clears> tahara <throat> is so important they started tahara. After that, they talked about salah in the same order that salah, uh, zakah, haram, uh, asom, and then hajj. After hajj, they, there's other things that happen in your life which don't fall under the ibadat, don't fall under the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they are more like interactions between people. So the scholars said the first thing people do after they worship Allah and they fulfill their Islamic uh, uh, duties is to start to buy and sell. Everyone needs to buy and sell in order for them to eat and to be able to live. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, you know, uh, uh, to do so. So they mentioned Kitab al the book of uh, buying and selling. After people buy and sell, what happens to them is they usually, subhanAllah, um, you know, uh, everyone buys and sells, but then a big portion of people want to get married. Once they have money, they get married and they start a family. So the scholars talk about Kitab al After marriage, subhanAllah, um, uh, you know, problems might happen. There is Kitab al and subhanAllah, after that, the scholars talk about, uh, you know, like after people get married, also what happens is some people start to fight, um, not after marriage, so stuff like I mean, but after people, um, you know, um, get married, uh, after people have bought and sold, what happens, people are happy in their life, people just start to fight between each other. So there's Kitab al Jinayat, where people start to attack each other and harm each other. And then fiqh ends, the last book in fiqh is Qaba, uh, which is um, judging between people who are fighting. And then Kitab al Iqq. talks about the rulings of freeing, freeing people from slavery. But the scholars put Iqq, put freeing in the end of the book so that with the intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also free them from the, from the uh, hellfire, from Nabi Jahannam. <clears throat> okay. He said the first one is Shahadat Allah ilaha illa Allah from the Rasulullah. So um, uh, I'm not going to talk much about the detail of these rulings, but uh, just quickly, inshallah ta'ala. The most important thing for us to know here is that in Shahada, the majority of scholars believe that 
saying ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah is a condition is a condition for one to be considered a muslim in this life for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your your belief is enough so if someone was to believe that there's no god other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala muhammad صلى الله but they weren't able to pronounce it they didn't have the chance no one taught them then inshallah ta'ala in the hereafter allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their sins and will give them jannah but for us we cannot pray on someone salat al janazah we can't treat them we can't give them the rulings of a muslim unless they say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah also if someone was to say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah but they are munafiq they didn't believe inside their heart then for us we treat them as a muslim but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to treat them as a muslim in their next life okay next one is iqam as salah so praying uh, establishing salah now a salah has a very alhamdulillah you know very long long detailed explanation that we're going to get to inshallah so we're not going to spend too much time talking about salah and then ita uh, zakah of course giving money for the rich of the uh, of the community to give money to the poor of the community and um after that is a salam ramadan so fasting the month of ramadan and um and then hajj al bayt man istata'a ili sabila those who are able to perform hajj must perform hajj the next uh, section after that after this is the section of arkan al iman he said rahimahullah ta'ala fasl arkan arkan al iman sitta an tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa al yawm al akhir wa bil qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min allah ta'ala brother jawad inshallah can you read Uh, section the integrals of imam faith are six to believe in allah to believe in his angels to believe in his books to believe in his messengers to believe in the final day to believe in destiny good and evil is from allah the exalted subhanahu wa ta'ala okay jazakumullah khairan barakallahu fikum okay so iman <clears throat> has two definitions the definition of iman according to the arabic language the word iman means to believe in something but Uh, in the understanding of the scholars of islam there's a lot of, uh, of of explanation but the basic meaning of iman the pillars of iman is to believe in these things and to also consider yourself as someone who accepts these things and follows them so in arabic they say at tasdiq bima jaa bihi an nabiy sallallahu alaihi wasallam وحديث النفس التابع للجزم so you saying to yourself i accept this i am a follower of this i believe in this this is what iman is if someone knows the truth but he doesn't accept it he doesn't consider himself as a follower of this truth then his iman does not uh, doesn't mean anything you have to submit yourself to these beliefs in order for you to be a muslim so iman is the belief plus submitting yourself to that belief and considering yourself a follower of that that's what iman means to believe in these things allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu to believe that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is the ever existing subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is not like anything that he created subhanahu wa ta'ala everything out there is created is not like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what uh, to believe that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, created everything uh, from nothing um his angels alayhim uh, salam now angels according to the belief of ahl sunnah the sunnah belief that angels are, uh uh bodies that are created from light so they're very light we don't feel them we don't see them around us because they're so light um and they are not uh, male nor female and the angels that are mentioned in the quran by name uh, we must believe in their names as mentioned in the Quran and the other angels that are not mentioned in the Quran or Sunnah we don't have to believe in their names we have to believe in them generally this is that's well known to all of you of course inshallah ta'ala um and then the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same thing uh that's inshallah ta'ala, well known to you all uh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down books to to his uh, prophets uh and um and rusulihi the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's 25 prophets that are mentioned in the Quran We have to believe in the names of these prophets. 25 prophets. The rest of the prophets we have to believe in them generally. So um Adam alayhi salam, Idris alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Saleh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, uh Ishaq alayhi salam, Yaqub alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam, Ayyub, Shu'ayb alayhi salam, Al-Yasa alayhi salam, Dawud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, Ilyas alayhi salam, Yunus alayhi salam, Zakaria alayhi salam, Yahya alayhi salam, Uzair alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, wa Nabiyyuna Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now 
in Aqidah, they mention the conditions of a prophet and or, you know, um, all of that. But just quickly, I want to mention that there are four main things that a prophet needs to have in order for him to be a prophet. He has to, of course, receive a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he has to be uh, truthful. He can't be a liar. He has to also convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be truthful and to convey. And he has to be trustworthy. He has to have amana. He has to be trustworthy. Uh, and faqana. he can't be stupid. He can't be silly. Uh, he has to be someone who has, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, sharp mind. Uh, in order for him to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> and then you have to live in the in, in Yawm al-Akhir. What is Yawm al-Akhir, the last day? What does the last day mean? Many Muslims read the word Yawm al-Akhir and they don't really understand what it means. So the scholars of Islam have gone into detail of the meaning of, uh, detail of, the, meaning of the last day. And um, basically, um, the majority of scholars believe that um, uh, the last day is when we are resurrected. And the reason that it's called the last day is that there is no night, nor is, is there day after that. So the sun and the moon will go. There'll be no sun and moon after uh, Yom Qiyamah. So that's why it's called the last day, because that day is basically yani, ongoing. There's no end to that day. There's no sun and night that uh, put an end to this day. That's why it's called the last day, the final day. Why? Because there's no sun and no moon after that day. <clears throat> Um, uh, and then you have to believe in Qadr. Qadr khayrihi wa shari. What is Qadr and what is Qadr? Qadr basically, um, according to the majority of Ahlul Sunnah, uh, is, uh, as they say, iradatullahi al-ashya' fi al-azal ala ma hi alihi fi ghir al-azal. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, before creation, uh, before the beginning of time, wanted everything to be as it was and as it will be uh, until the end of time. Everything that was going to happen happened according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted. So everything that happens uh, is according to the uh, irada, to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he chose that subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what al Iman al Qadr uh, means according to the majority of Ahl Sunnah wal uh, Jama'ah. Uh, after that, inshallah, we'll go to the next section. Uh, after that, he said, فَصْلٌ وَمَعْنَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا مَعْبُودَ بِحَقِّ فِي الْوُجُودِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَالَى أخي جوان Section The meaning of the kalima is in reality none is worthy of worship except Allah أخي سبحان الله This word يعني سبحان الله If we were to spend you know hours and hours we wouldn't end explaining the beauty of this word but we don't have time سبحان الله May Allah forgive us Now La ilaha illallah is the word as Imam Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, the, you know, the great Imam of Shafi Madhab, as he mentioned that uh, the scholars, those who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have chosen la ilaha illallah to be the main dhikr that they use over time, day and night. The, the way to remember Allah is through la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, always la ilaha illallah. And subhanAllah, this, uh, what Imam Nawi mentioned is mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, as he said, you know, أفضل ما قلت أنا والنبيون قبلي لا إله إلا الله um, uh, لا إله إلا الله <coughs> Now, some of the benefits of saying لا إله إلا الله I'll just mention quickly, inshallah ta'ala uh, Number one, uh, in the hadith, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it forbidden for the fire, for how fire to eat he who says لا إله إلا الله to eat the flesh of someone who says لا إله إلا الله إن الله حرم على النار uh, uh, قال لا إله إلا الله. Also, um, in another hadith uh, narrated in al Jamia al-Sagheer, that um, the one who says La ilaha illallah multiple times, 100 times a day, um, in the Day of Judgment will, will come with a light face. His face will have nur on it, will have uh, a lot of nur on it. And um, subhanAllah, the, another narration says that the key of Jannah is La ilaha illallah. So try to always say La ilaha illallah as much as you can. And never stop saying that word. Um, it, the benefit of this word, subhanAllah, is, 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 is huge, subhanAllah. Um, inshallah ta'ala, after that, um, there's another section, which is Alamatul um, Bulugh. But I think we have gone over time. So, um, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll stop on Tahara. So, Kitab al-Tahara, 
uh, which is um, the book of, of, of cleanliness, of Tahara, like we mentioned, is going to be where we start on the next test, inshallah ta'ala, because um, I don't want to go over time. Um, inshallah, um, we have five minutes, inshallah ta'ala, for any interactions or questions, inshallah ta'ala. And the rest of the questions we can we can take in, in the um, uh, in the group, inshallah ta'ala, and also uh, in two weeks' time, inshallah, uh, next week, not this week, next week, and uh, face to face lesson, inshallah, we'll also have a chance to, to have questions, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah ta'ala khayr, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Anyone have any questions? I had a question, Shay. Uh, no. So you mentioned in terms of um Yom al Qiyamah that um it's defined as the final day. No. Um Yom al Akhir. It's defined as the final day because there's no sun or moon after it. No. With regards to the hadith of like when the sun will become like won't be near to the people on the day of resurrection, is that after we're resurrected or like when is that? No, after we're resurrected, but um as we know, um, uh, after that, the sun will disappear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy the sun after that. Okay. So, um, of course, yeah, after that, the sun will disappear. And um, uh, subhanahu there will be no, no sun on the moon after that. Um, there will be light, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help create light in Jannah. But um, okay. it won't be the same as, as the light that we find in this dunya. Exactly. Ustaz, I have a question. I know, uh, the companions are the one who witnessed Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and died as Muslim. No. So, for example, if he's a Nasrani, he's a Christian, he witnessed Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But uh, after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam died, uh, he became a Muslim and died as a Muslim. Is he con is he considered no. as a companion? No. So the definition, the the, the definition according to the, what, the, what the scholars mentioned is man man ra'a Rasulullah mu'minan bihi wa mata ala dalik. So to, he witnessed Rasulullah as a Muslim, believing in Rasulullah, and then died believing in Rasulullah. So if someone witnessed Rasulullah but he wasn't believing, then he said to Islam later on, he's not a Sahabi. But if someone witnessed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a Muslim, and then left Islam after Rasulullah, and then went back to Islam and died upon Islam, then he is a Sahabi. And there is one example for this. So in the in the seerah, one of the examples is that one of the uh, uh, one of the, the leaders of the Arabs he accepted Islam and then he he committed ridda. He left Islam at the time when everyone was leaving Islam. And the end of his life, at the time of Umar عنه, he came back to Islam. He was considered a Sahabi. He was considered a Sahabi. But um, Subhanallah, if if they didn't believe in Rasulullah when I saw him, then khalas. Because the the benefit that you get. Seeing Rasulullah, witnessing Rasulullah, and believing in him. You don't believe in something, khalas. The nur, the benefit, the benefit doesn't come to you, subhanAllah. When, if, if someone was to attend the class, but they, they, they didn't believe, they didn't think that it was a proper thing to study, they wouldn't benefit from the most knowledgeable person in, 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 in the uh, 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 yeah, the, uh, they wouldn't benefit from it. So subhanAllah, benefiting Rasulullah only happens when you believe in him. So you have to believe in Rasulullah for the moment that you saw him in order for you to be in a Sheikh, I had a question too. Um, so I wanted, you said that Qadr is whatever Allah's written um, calls, like as in whatever he wants to happen will happen. No. Um, so let's say the, someone makes a dua to like change their Qadr. Does it like, is that also written now? Um, yeah. So um, basically Qadr has two meanings. Yeah. So that's not the qadr that I'm talking about. Now, um, uh, there's two types of qadr when you, in, in, in the Quran and the hadith. Um, the first type of qadr is the qadr that's mentioned in the hadith, al-iman al-qadr, believing qadr, which is a, a condition for a person to be considered a Muslim. This qadr is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The will of Allah, sorry, the will, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That doesn't change. The qadr that changes is what is written for us. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote down, wrote, uh, made order the pen to write everything down that's going to happen. So something's written down, but the writing can change. What's written down for us can change according to the will of Allah. 
So they both fall under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has no beginning. The will of Allah is before time. That does not change, but what was written down can change, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for it to change and willed for us to make dua for it to change. So what happens when you make dua for something to change? What might change is the what's written down, but not the original qadr, which is the, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's two different definitions for qadr. The one when we talk about Akan Iman is what is the main definition. And then the other definition of Qadr, meaning what was written down in, 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 uh, before we were created, something like that, that is a different type of Qadr that we're not talking about. Right, yeah. Okay, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, if there's no one else, we will wrap up inshallah ta'ala just for Salat al-Maghrib for those in Melbourne. And Jazakum uh, Khairan for attending. It was a pleasure being with you all. And um, mashallah, yani. inshallah ta'ala, I hope to, to, to get to know everyone, inshallah ta'ala, and coming to Ross, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, benefit from you all, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum Khairan. Any feedback you, uh, you can send in the group, you can send to me private, inshallah ta'ala, questions, anything that you, any mistakes that you found, anything you would like uh, to change, I am happy to, inshallah ta'ala, to, to take that all on board inshallah ta'ala barakallah feekum inshallah ta'ala we'll end with a short dua and then we'll, we'll go off inshallah ta'ala subhanakallah wa bihamdik subhanallah wa bihamdik wa bihamdik wa bihamdik wa bihamdik wa salli wa sallim ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim ajma'in allahumma alimna ma yafa'na wa fa'na ba'alamtana wa zidna alimna allahumma atina kufna taqwaha wa zakiha anta khair min zakiha anta waliyuha mawlaha allahumma ahsin aqibatana fi al-umri kulliha wa ajirna min khizi al-dunya ala al-akhira اللهم أصلح حالنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعلنا هداة المهتدين غير الضالين ولا المضلين منك وكرمك وجودك وإحسانك يا أكرم الأكرمين يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وسأل الله تعالى خيرا إن شاء الله we'll see you all next week السلام عليكم